While understanding cache in Mule, we often get confused with the relation between cache scope and object store with questions like can cache scope be used without object store? The answer is yes. Does object store has any existence without cache scope? The answer is yes again. The object store can be used for storing watermarks. It can also be used in idempotent message filter. Similarly, we might have confusions like what is in memory object store? What is a persistent object store? What is object store v2? So let's try to answer all of these questions in the upcoming slide. So let's get started. Let's understand the basics. For example, we have an application which calls a database and it gets the details from the database and it's often a static data that we are retrieving from the database. So it does make sense to implement a cache and store the data. For example, here we have a key as currency and value as AUD. So it's basically a key value pair and it also has other attributes like the time when it's cached and the time when it expires. So this is also called as time to live. Like in this case, it lives for two hours. So once cached at 11 hour, it gets expired at the 13th hour. So well, this looks good when your application is a single application. Whenever someone again calls your application and asks for currency, the current currency we have is AUD. But what if we scale the application horizontally across multiple nodes into a cluster? So we have two other instances of the same application and even they will have their own cache. And this type of cache is called as a private cache or a local cache, which is local to that particular instance only. So what is the problem over here now? For example, let's take a request that hits this particular node at 10th hour. So it caches the data and the value for currency is now INR, meaning that we are accepting INR only at this point of time. So it returns the currency as INR and it expires at 12. All right. Now, when the request again comes at 11 to the same node, it still gets INR. But if it comes to the second node, it gets AUD because it is cached at 11 and around if I hit at 11.30, I would get AUD from this particular node. And if I hit this with the same request to the first node at 1130, I'll get currency as INR. So what do we observe? We observe that we get an inconsistent data because the cache TTL is different and the time when it loaded is also different. So we are getting inconsistent data and it can cause problems. Same is the case with the third node. If someone hits the third node, since it got cached at 14th hour, he'll get another value. So the data remains inconsistent. So what should we do about cache in such distributed systems? So distributed systems call out for the need of a distributed cache. So the solution is put a cache system not inside the node, but at a place which is at a equidistant from the destination system and the calling system. So we have put it at a place which is outside all of this node and we can place our cache over here. So this becomes a single source of truth for all of the calling systems. So whenever the call is received, it will check in the cache. If that particular key is not present, it will get from the database, store it in this distributed cache and then send it. So here we are getting rid of the inconsistency because we have a single point of storage for all the cache, right? So in Mule, this is implemented by the object store V2, which is available as an external service, meaning that we can also 
call the object store v2 externally it doesn't necessarily mean that you should have a mule application to call object store v2 once you deploy your application and enable object store v2 on it you can use the object store api and pass the client id and client secret and also get the data so object store v2 provides a distributed caching mechanism you can also use your own caching implementation you can also you use redis cache so this is about distributed caching now there is also another mechanism of caching like if you just want to cache the response of this api instead of going through the whole process if you get a request and you know that it is a repeated request you can implement caching in the form of an http caching policy which is available out of the box in the api manager so these are uh, two different ways you can also do caching apply policy use uh, object store v2 or use an internal in memory object store now when i say it is in internal in memory object store it means that it is stored on the volatile memory that is your ram you can also make it as a persistent store where when in case if you want it to survive any restarts so you make it persistent so what it will do it will store the cache into the hard disk drive so that won't be volatile and it will survive any restarts or if you want consistency or synchronization of cache across a cluster of nodes you can go with object store v2 or your external caching so that's about the basics of a caching mechanism or you can also use caching policy also so let's move ahead and understand the working of a cache scope how exactly the cache scope in mule works so i have a flow and this flow is enclosed in a cache scope so whenever a request comes it checks if the request is repeatable or not in some cases they also call it is as consumable or not so what do we mean by repeatable uh, to understand repeatable i would suggest you to go through my previous videos on streams where i have explained what is a repeatable stream so when i say repeatable payload that means that it is a repeatable stream or not or you can also call it as com consumable so if it is repeatable only then it will come inside the cache scope or else it will if it is not repeatable it will go through the normal flow it won't be cached so why why exactly it has to be a repeatable payload because the default mule caching converts your payload into a unique key and then checks if the key is already present in the cache or not so in case if the cache scope takes in the payload converts it into some unique key and if it turns out to be a non repeatable payload a non repeatable stream so effectively it gets consumed by the cache scope so there's nothing left with the processor in the flow to process because it got consumed with cache scope and then the processors will not get any payload so that's the reason it has to be a repeatable payload so once the first criteria gets finished gets passed it moves on to the next step which is creating a key so the default mechanism generates an sha256 key generator combines it with a sha256 digest and then the key is created and this key is then checked if it is present in the object store or not it could be a local cache means local uh, in memory object store it could be a persistent object store or it could be the object store v2 but since we are talking about default we are not talking about object store v2 we are just talking about the in memory or the persistent store so it will search for the data that is the key and if suppose the key is not found it is considered to be a cache miss so it doesn't have the cache stored yet so what it will do it will call the flow so in this case we have an http requester it will call the requester then do transformations and then return the response 
effectively it will transfer the response to some other processor inside the flow the flow doesn't finish here there could be some other processor as well and then once the value is generated when, when it, once it comes out of cache scope before coming out it will store the value in the form of key value pair so this is the key that we got which was not present which was not existing and then we have the value which is being returned by the processing the payload that has been written gets cached over here so we have successfully got a cache now what if the value exists already so that is called as a cache hit so again if this part succeeds and it's able to find the value in the cache it's able to find the key already existing in the cache it will just return the value and the value can be used by other processor so this two processor won't be executed at all but instead a value would be passed by the cache scope as it is to the next processor so this is how a cache scope works if you do not specify any caching strategy it uses a default caching strategy and this is what happens in a default caching strategy so you would observe that there is no time to live defined in default caching strategy we'll see that in the demo but you don't have any ttl or your custom logic for this so default strategy is just giving you basic caching mechanism if you want to modify it you have to use a custom caching strategy now let's move on to the next slide let's see what all caching options do we have with mule so one is the default caching option that we just saw so default provides you in memory storage it also provides you a persistent storage you can use either of them but when if it is default it it, it is just uh, storing everything into the memory that is the volatile or ram when you use the object store connector for caching it again provides you two different options to just store it to your node it provides you uh, in memory operation uh, in memory object store or it can also give you a persistent object store that will store into some file system but if you do not want a look uh, um, an object store local to your node it can also offer an object store v2 service which is a cloud hub service and it stores the values into that service now if it is on prem the things get slightly different we'll see that then you also have an option to specify or create your own custom object store or use an external service like redis cache so when i say custom you can specify a spring bean to provide as a object store you can also try to use a database depending upon your requirements so there are three main options available for caching when i talk about object store v2 you get on cloud hub the object store v2 connector automatically configures itself to use the object store v2 service which is present in the same availability zone where your application gets deployed but in case if it is on premise it uses a shared memory grid it doesn't uses the object store v2 service but it will use a shared memory grid which will be used across uh, the nodes which will be shared across the nodes and from what i know i think it is a hazel cast uh, a memory which is replicated on multiple nodes so from where uh, multiple nodes and you can use it from there so cloud hub offers object store v2 service and even on cloud hub you can have in memory or persistent uh, but on premise it could be in memory or persistent you cannot access object store v2 service using the object store v2 connector in on premise there are ways to access the object store v2 service from on premise system but for that you need to use an http requester and then call the object store v2 service using the client id credential client id and secret credentials that get generated while deploying the application so these are all the different caching options available let's move on to the next slide
and understand uses use cases for caching so like we already uh, discussed in the previous slide that it can be used for item potent message filter what do we, we mean by item potent message filter suppose you have a transaction like some user uh, triggers a request for some payment he does the payment but he is not getting he hasn't got the response yet and he's impatient and he hits the second time so you do not want the payment to be duplicated you do not want the payment to uh, trigger twice so in that case you use an idempotent message filter which will check if the message has come again or not so to check this it should obviously have the previous record right if the request came previously or not so it has to store it somewhere so in that scenario uh, we use the object store the object store is used behind the scenes in i important message filter second is static data within time to live for example like we saw in the first slide right we had a database and we were getting the values back from the database and those values used to change after like every two hours or something so two hours is your time to live right so if that if we have such static data so and calling the backend system and again and again for a data which remains static for almost like four to five hours or maybe two hours doesn't make sense right so we can store such data into a cache and send it back we can also use as a fallback API alternative. So when we talk about circuit breakers, if your API is down and your circuit breaker opens the circuit and you are getting error response again and again, you're not able to hit the API because circuit breaker has opened up. So you can call a fallback API, but suppose even the fallback API is down the worst case scenario the fallback API is also not honoring the request. In that case, what we can do, we can use the cached response and that cached response can be sent back. So it's better to offer a degraded service than to completely not offer the service. So in that case also, we can use caching. And fourth is a small data size. Obviously, if we have a small data size that we can cache, it, it does make sense but if it is a huge data size then I believe caching is not a good idea we should come up with some other alternatives so here are a few use cases of caching and also the object store now when to use in-memory caching so we discussed this what is in-memory caching the in-memory caching remains local to that particular node if it is on-prem if it is on cloud up to that particular mule application in that worker okay so it is in memory so when does it make sense to use in memory it makes sense to use in memory when your data size is small typically hardly few kbs right you can use in memory because ultimately it will get stored in the heap space of your uh, application now when the data does not need to be synchronized across nodes which means that you do not have transaction or state data in that case you can use in memory caching like we saw in the first slide right if you have just a static data which doesn't even change any time you can right away go with the memory caching but if it if the data needs to be synchronized across multiple nodes that all the nodes should have the same data then it's not a good idea to go with in memory caching and once the server or the node gets restarted the in memory caching gets lost because it is volatile so you should also keep this in mind that if the data can be loaded again after every server restart go ahead with in memory caching now when to use a persistent caching so persistent caching is similar to the in-memory caching with the only difference that it is persistent. It does not store inside the heap space. Instead, it uses a file store system to store your data. So it can be used when the data size is big and it should survive the restarts. Now when to use a distributed caching. 
So we also saw this example in the first slide. Distributed caching is when you need synchronization between multiple nodes, means all of them should send us one data only, they should not send different data. It's important to be synchronized, okay? When you can also use when transactional data such as OAuth session ID is being provided by Mule and you have to use that you have to use idempotent message filtering logic in that case uh, and your application is distributed across multiple nodes in that case you might want to use distributed caching and you would also need when uh, you want to do data replication in case of disaster recovery when your application is on multiple availability zone and you want a disaster recovery you can use distributed caching now when to use external caching, external caching when you uh, use some third party caching like a Redis cache. So even object store v2 can also be called as uh, an external caching because it provides you an API to directly access the cache. So it's not just restricted to the mule application. So that is why when multiple teams are involved, so it could be some team working on different technology not just mulesoft but if they could be on spring boot they could be on some other application so when multiple teams are involved you can use an external caching like redis owner of data lies within multiple teams same as the first point and individual system wants to invalidate the data like anyone uh, like if you have 10 uh, systems all on different technology and any one of them can invalidate the data because of their requirement so you can use an external caching like redis cache so these are a few uh, examples when you should use uh, external caching so so far we discussed the basics of caching how many options we have in caching and what all scenarios are there where we can implement caching now we'll do a quick demo to understand what all we have discussed so far so I have a flow over here which has implemented cache scope and then I have a transform inside the cache scope. I've added a couple of loggers to understand how the cache is working. So let's just quickly go through the flow. There is a listener in this logger. I have placed a request received message. Then I have put a cache scope. I haven't done anything. So it's by default using the default caching strategy no filter no referencing to caching strategy just the plain default strategy then inside the cache scope i have just added cache scope begin so that we understand that it has entered the cache scope or not then i have a transform message which just converts the payload into hello world json and returns it back and after the transformation i have added a log statement cache scope end and then I have a logger again saying response sent. So now let's try the first scenario. The first condition for cache scope to work was it should have a repeatable stream or a consumable uh, payload, non-consumable payload, right? Because if it is consumable, it gets consumed and then it's not accessible. So what we'll do, we'll make this stream as non-repeatable so that it the cache should not work right if it is non-repeatable if it it is repeat, repeat, repeatable it works but if it is not then it doesn't so let's try with a non-repeatable stream i'll save this and i'll run this project so let's see what do we get so the application has been deployed now i'll hit the request and see what do we get as the output so i am triggering a get request to the listener or at port 8081 and I'm getting a hello world response right now let's go back to the console and see what do we get so this was the first run so obviously uh, it has it should have entered the cache scope and we would have got this logs so let's check the console and we got request received and observe what do we get we get something from the runtime internal object store caching strategy which says message will be processed without cache payload is consumable like we discussed already right if we use a non repeatable stream it becomes consumable because it is can be consumed and then it gets lost 
so it is consumable so it will be processed without cache so it's as effective as not even having this cache scope then we get the cache scope begin log and the cache scope end log after that we have the final response sent log you can also check this we have the cache scope end cache scope begin and the request response sent log so all the logs are coming as expected now let's try if the cache is really working or not let's try to hit it again so if it if the cache is working we will not see these two logs that is cache scope begin and cache scope end let's try ideally it should not the cache scope should not work right so because uh, the payload was consumable so it should not so let's try to hit it again we got the response let's go back to the console and check the logs so again we have the same thing message will be processed without cache we got a request received cache scope begin and cache scope end and then the response sent so what we saw in the slide has been proved over here that if the payload is consumable or the stream is non-repeatable the cache scope won't work now let's just make the stream as repeatable and let's see how it behaves does the cache scope work now or it doesn't so let's go to advanced tab of the listener and change the streaming strategy to repeatable file stream and just save it so that it gets redeployed if you want to understand what all these things are you uh, should watch my previous video on streams that would give you a better idea of what all this memory size and buffer unit means so meanwhile okay i think it has got deployed okay it didn't get saved let's save it again so the application has been redeployed now let's trigger the request let's send and let's check the logs what do we get see the log has been removed right the log which was saying consumable uh, payload and won't be processed by cache got removed which means that a cache scope should work now so since this was the first round the and the cache did not exist we got the uh, logs present in the cache scope that is cache scope begin and cache scope end. we got this two log but now when the second time we trigger the request we should not get those logs let's trigger it again and let's see the output so yes what do we observe the logs are lost we just re got request received and response sent so it didn't trigger all of this right so we understood that if it is a repeatable stream only then it will the cache scope will come into action otherwise not so this was with the default caching strategy now you can also use a filter logic to exclude specific messages from the cache scope so when you mention anything in the filter whatever is present in this filter will if the request has a payload according to this filter only those requests will be cached otherwise they won't be cached so let's try out a demo on this also so i've made a couple of changes now the change that i have done is i've added a filter condition and as per the filter condition if the payload meets this condition that is if it has an id equal to one only then it will be cached otherwise it won't be cached all right and i have also made a change in this transform like if the payload id is one then we should get a hello there message otherwise we should get hello world message right so this would pretty much help us to understand what's going on right so let's go to postman and trigger the request again so i'll pass the id as one first of all so let's see if the caching is working or not so let's just pass id as one perfect we got the message as hello there the transform has worked and what do we see in the logs we see that request received cache scope begin means it entered the cache scope and the cache scope got and ended and we got a response sent message now let me trigger it again so in this case 
it should not enter the cache scope instead it should just return the cache response so let's trigger it again we get the output as hello there and let's see the logs so log says request received and response sent so we don't have this two logs coming in right now what if i change the id so caches should only work for id if it is one if it is two cache should never work so let's trigger it again and we see we are getting hello world as opposed to hello there because id is two and observe the time difference it's 268 milliseconds right and let's check the log now in this case request received cache scope begin cache scope end and response sent so it entered the cache scope what if i hit it again the cache scope now should not work right it should allow to enter it because we have added a filter condition so let's try to hit and let's check the logs and what do we see we get a request received cache scope begin cache scope end and response sent which means that the filter condition is working perfectly so whatever we mention in the filter condition and the payload meeting those condition only that payload's response will be cached others won't be cached at all right so that is what we can conclude over here for the filter condition now this was the default caching strategy that we used now we can also reference to a strategy so let's try to reference a strategy you need to click on reference strategy let's create a new reference strategy now i won't go with an object so now instead what i'll do i'll use a reference strategy to generate the key earlier the key was generated based on the payload what we saw in the slide also that it uses an H SHA256 algorithm with a key generator to generate the key. We can also give a custom key expression like let's give it as an ID payload dot ID. So whatever the ID is that will become the key for the caching table and associated value will be stored you can also use a key generator so when you use a key generator you have to define a java object basically a bean with your custom logic to create the key but i am i don't want to do that instead i'll just go with a basic key expression you can use it depending on your requirement so we'll just use a basic key expression that is payload.id and hit OK now I don't want to use filter so let's just get rid of this filter and just save it so that the application will get redeployed and then let's check what out output do we get okay the application has been redeployed I think it is not saved let's save again okay looks like it has been redeployed now for id1 we should get hello there and for id2 we should get uh, hello world right id1 there and hello world for id not then not equal to one now all of them should be saved in the cache scope because we have removed filter and we have given a id generator as the key that we have right so now let's just trigger it let's trigger okay fine let's go with id2 let's send it and we get hello world as the response and observe the time is 663 milliseconds okay let's check the logs request received cache scope begin end and response has been sent perfect it entered the cache scope now since we remove the filter condition uh, it should work fine now let's trigger it again see the drop it's only 28 milliseconds from 6 30 milliseconds it came to 28 because the cache has worked now right see the cache worked and we could see only two logs and the response is hello world what if i pass it as one cache is not populated it will get populated and this time it will use the key as this id rather than generating the key for the whole payload using those algorithm it will just 
create the key so let's trigger a send and should take a while like it took 543 milliseconds let's see the logs request received cache scope log end log and response sent now let's hit the second time. and we also observe that the payload has changed right since it was one we got hello there let's trigger again we get the same payload and the time has reduced to 23 milliseconds right and if we check the logs it just request sent and request received and request sent so it didn't come in the cache scope it the cache scope just returned a value it's a, no matter how many times you trigger it now it will give you the same response it won't even reach the cache inside the cache scope right and uh, notice that we have no option to uh, specify any time to live and all of this gets stored in memory because this is default caching we are not doing anything now if you want to customize this if you want to add uh, some customized caching strategy you need to reference to an object store as of now everything is getting stored into a in memory uh, onto your uh, heap space now let's quickly try out one more example does the variable or anything gets cached or not so let's try to add a set variable and what i'll do is give the variable name as hello and value as world and let's see what we get let's okay let's add a logger also to understand what value are uh, we getting ideally the value of the variable does not get cached so you should not get the variable value variable vars dot hello sorry it's vars dot hello yeah save it should get redeployed quickly okay the application got redeployed perfect now let's hit the request with id as one in the first run we should be able to see the value so we are getting world right scope begin response send cache scope end and then we got the variable value which is world now it is cached right so we should not get the variable so let's yeah so we are not getting the value right we are getting request received and then this logger prints the variable it's null and response end. so what do we conclude over here only the payload the message the mule events message payload gets cached and not the variables inside the event so this is a point uh, sh you should keep in mind now let's move on to the object store so i've removed the variable now let's quickly add a object store uh, go to the reference strategy uh let's edit this reference strategy and it says consider adding a module so we need to add a module that's basically a pom dependency for object store so let's go to object store v2 v1 is only for mule 3 uh, v2 is for mule 4 application so i think i'll need to log in so let's quickly log in so i've logged in and i've searched for object store so i get an object store connector so this is what we need let's add this so it's adding object store connector basically it will do nothing but add a maven dependency in pom.xml and it will download the connector to my local maven repository that is the m2 folder that's it what it is doing so let it download so it has got downloaded now maybe we need to open it again so that it is visible again so let's click on this caching strategy edit it and yeah so now we have an option right it's none what we can do is we can edit in line and we can give some alias so now let's understand what all things are present over here first of all you can enter any alias that you want uh, it's custom whatever you want second the persistent checkbox so if you uncheck this it will load everything into the memory 
that is the volatile memory or the RAM or the heap space, right? If you check this, it will push the data to a persistent storage that is your disk drive onto any file system. So choose this depending on your requirement if the payload size is less and you're comfortable with like uh, having everything to be on your heap space. This will slightly give you a better performance if this is unchecked. If this is checked, a slightly slow performance because it has to do IO operations, right? So choose accordingly. Max entries means the number of entries that you can have in the object store. So this could be your in memory or your persistent depending on this. But there is a point to note. If you deploy this application onto Cloud Hub and check the object store V2 option available in Cloud Hub, in that case, it's not going to use in memory or the disk space for storing this. Instead, it will use the object store V2 service. That is a point to remember, right? Now, the max entry, you can specify it over here. Now let's just give me an al alias uh, like uh, caching, right? Max entries, I would say I just want uh, two entries, not more than that. Entry TTL, it means how long should that entry live? So you can define like maybe five seconds. I want it to survive for like five, oh, let's increase this 10 seconds. The unit is by default 10 seconds. So the moment it comes, the value gets cached. It stays there for 10 seconds. After that, it gets expired. All right. And you have the expiration interval. Now, what is the difference between TTL and expiration interval? So important point to note over here is the expiration interval is a thread that runs after the given interval. Suppose you specify expiration interval as five seconds. So that thread will run for five, uh, run after every five seconds to check if any cache has got expired or not. So first time when it got deployed and the cache got populated, so it has a life of 10 seconds, right? And it start and the interval starts at every five seconds. So the second time it will be able to remove this entry from the cache successfully but for first time it won't be because the entry was still existing but the second time it will because at the second time the entry got expired okay and if not second time the third time it will definitely remove it so always remember do not give this expiration interval time same as entry ttl because that would cause problem for example if you give this entry time ttl is 24 hours let's assume that you have given it as 24 hours and you give expiration interval also as 24 hours so what happens the expiration interval cycle will start as soon as your application starts up and after 24 hours it will run the cycle and suppose uh, i deployed the application now uh, at 16 16 hour right today okay uh, so the expiration interval will run tomorrow at 16 hour but the cache got populated at around uh, like 16 5 right so the next day 16 5 the cache will uh, get expire its entry detail will finish but the thread of expiration interval ran tomorrow at 16 a 16 hours right so it missed that time so now again in, in in effectively the ttl became more than 24 hours for your cache because the expiration interval has missed the cache right so always remember put some value that should be able to remove this ttl because otherwise you would land up with problem that your cache never gets refreshed right so put some value like 10 and expiration interval like every five, uh, five seconds uh, let's put it as second not as hours so yeah this is second and this is second so that is what you should uh, always keep in mind and again you have event key option you can uh, create the event key or let it uh, create the key on its own it's up to you 
configuration reference suppose you have an object store created and you want to put configuration reference you can also use this so uh, as of now we don't want to use it uh, we just want to go with this so now let's just save it and I don't want it to be persistent I want it to be in memory so let me just save it click on OK and let's see if the application gets redeployed it's getting ready so I've deployed the application with the new changes for the object store now let's trigger uh, let's click on send and what do we observe that the loggers inside the cache scope got executed let's trigger it again and the loggers inside cache scope were not executed and since we defined the time to live as 10 seconds let's just wait for 10 seconds for the cache to expire and then the another thread to scavenge those expiration expired uh, cache should run and we should be able to get rid of that cache so i think it should be fine now let's trigger it again and let's see what do we get yeah the cache scope begin cache scope end and the response has been sent so effectively the cache got expired and we got now again if we hit we will get the cached response so we understood how to link the object store with the cache scope to leverage the object uh, store and we have used only the in-memory object store and the persistent object store and if you want to see where actually these files get persisted when the object store is persistent you can go to the location where you have the anypoint studio go to plugins and then one of the tooling server you can also get it through uh, mule.home so mule.home will tell you where exactly is it then you can go to the mule folder dot mule and the application name and you will find this object store folder since we used only in memory object store we would not have anything in this file if i open it let's just open it with notepad there's nothing in it right only cache written over here so if if at all if there is some data uh, cached in persistent will appear over here right and I took the latest file which was at 1617 so basically the persistent store is kept in this files so now that was about the object store and if it is on cloud hub and you want to leverage the object store v2 service for a distributed uh, system you have to manually check the object store in runtime manager you will have an option of enabling object store v2 so you have to check that option and then you can use the object store v2 so you can also access that object store v2 service externally using the rest apis uh, provided you can refer those in the mules of documentation and you will get a client id and secret and you can use it accordingly so object store v2 is not just used in the cache scope but it's also used in other components as we discussed in the slides like idem potent message validator right so here it has an object store so you can again edit inline global reference you can use an object store other than that the object store connector itself provides you a multiple operations like you can clear you can use the contains operation you can remove you can retrieve retrieve all retrieve all keys store so depending on your needs suppose i want to store then i can use the store and you can configure it accordingly you can give the key you can give the value accordingly and just uh, specify the object store connection suppose if you So if we click on create and then we can specify the time to live and all those configuration over here and the object store will be configured and this will ultimately if you have on if you are on cloud up and enable the checkbox for object store v2 it will get stored in the service or else it will either get stored in in memory or if persistence is enabled it will store in a 
file store system like we just saw so we can use multiple operations present over here for leveraging the object store uh, service or storing the data into the memory or a persistent store so uh, that's it for this video i hope you would have found the content uh, useful uh, thanks for watching